for this uh, very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me to present this talk. I haven't presented a lecture for about three years now, so I'm a little rusty and we shall see how it goes. Anyway, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of relaxation in, in paramagnetic systems. So I will begin by defining paramagnetic systems, giving you some examples. I'm going to then go through the, the, the early days of paramagnetic relaxation, early work. Uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit what, what is wrong with the early theories, why we, why we need something better. I will in particular discuss what happens when we are beyond what is called the perturbation regime. And I will also mention some, some other complications. And I will then uh, go a little, some, something, uh, go through something about the experimental strategies and give you examples of applications. And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to give a little outlook of what might, might be interesting development in future. So the paramagnetic systems are systems containing unpaired electrons, basically. And the special properties of, of paramagnetic systems are, are due to these unpaired electrons. And unpaired electron spin gives rise to a very large magnetic moment, which is about 660 times larger than, than that of proton. Paramagnetic molecules can often be studied by ESR, but the main topic of th this talk will be, will be NMR relaxation in paramagnetic systems. Now this large magnetic moment of the unpaired electron spin influences most of solution properties in, in NMR, uh, such as relaxation, shifts, splittings. But as I said, I will, I will limit myself to, to relaxation today. Important types of paramagnetic molecules that I'm going to mention are organic radicals and transition metal ions and, and their complexes. Oxygen gas is another example, but I will not talk about it. So let me start by the very beginning of, of relaxation, the, of theory of NMR relaxation, the famous Bloomberg and Purcell Pound paper from 1948. Uh, this is the first paper presenting theory of, of, of relaxation in NMR in general. And already in this very classic paper, the, the, the paramagnetic relaxation is mentioned as an interesting case. And here is a picture coming from, from uh, that work where we, uh, which displays the relaxation time uh, of protons in, in water in presence of paramagnetic metal ions, uh, as a f plotted as a function of, of concentration. So this is a kind of picture that, that we saw also last week in, in Professor Bodart's presentation of, of um, NMRD of Y. Now, uh, there are few general things about paramagnetic relaxation that I want to begin with. The paramagnetic species present in solution enhance the relaxation of nuclear spins basically independently of, of, the, of the chemical situation. And we can mention three cases. One is where the, the case where, where nuclear spin sits in the same molecule as a paramagnetic center on long time scale. And an example of this kind of system might be, uh, might be metalloproteins, uh, where we have a, a paramagnetic ion sitting more or less permanently in the, in the framework of the molecule. And then if we observe, for example, protons in this system or, or other nuclei in the system, we have this kind of chemical situation. Then what is also very common is that we have the nuclear spin is residing in exchangeable lig ligands. For example, uh, if we look at the uh, kind of measurements as, as those in, in, in my first slide, metal ions in water, that, that's the situation we have there. The metal ions uh, are swimming around in water and, and water molecules can 
reside either in the coordination sphere of the metal or in the bulk and exchange rapidly between these two situations. Then we have a, a, a little bit more complicated situation where the nuclear spin uh, resides in, in other molecules, uh, in, in different molecules than the, than the electron spin. So we are talking here about intermolecular interactions and example of that can be uh, nitroxides in, in organic solvents. Now, uh, the, the BPP theory gave, gave us the very basics of, of relaxation theory, but there are some uh, small mistakes in that paper. Uh, so the, the, the more correct theory of, of dipolar relaxation was presented in, by Solomon in 1955, and uh, Solomon and Bloomberg, and the same Bloomberg, and that was one of the authors of the BPP paper, uh, pointed out that also scalar coupling could lead to nuclear spin relaxation. So both these elements were, were included in, in the, in the mid-50s, as you can see. Uh, the works of Solomon and, Solomon and Bloomberg and were actually mainly uh, concerned with, with diamagnetic systems where we would have protons or fluorine spins interacting with each other by dipolar or scalar interactions. But this works applies also to the diamagnetic and to both the diamagnetic and paramagnetic systems. If we have the nuclear and the electron spins <coughs> in the same molecule, which would be the case for the this protein example or for the systems with chemical exchange where we would have uh, the water at least in term or the, the ligand intermittently uh, in the same molecule as, as the paramagnetic ion. Now, when talking about the, the understanding of, of relaxation uh, properties of, of pa in paramagnetic systems, we have to realize what we actually measure. What we measure uh, is not exactly the same thing as, we, as, as what we, so to say, can understand as going on in the paramagnetic species, species itself, because we have this exchange situation which need to be, which need to be con considered. So if we, uh, can, we can analyze this, this was done in the early 60s by Swift and Koenig and by Luz and Maibom, who in, in introduced the, the, the chemical exchange effect. So for example, for T1, uh, uh, minus one, there's been lattice relaxation rate. The index P here means that it's measured in, in it's a major, macroscopic quantity that we measure on our spectrometer is related to the relaxation time in the complex T1M, but we have also this exchange lifetime and we have the molar ratio of the, of the, uh, of the paramagnetic species and, and the ligands. So we, we, need to be, we need to be a little bit careful. We need to, to, to think about this exchange uh, properties coming into the picture. Now, the third element of the early theories, it was also developed in the early 60s. Uh, and this is the contribution again of Bloomberg, but now with another student, Morgan. So, uh, as I mentioned, what makes paramagnetics special is the presence of this very large uh, uh, ma magnetic moment of the, related to the electron spin which is also characterized by very rapid relaxation. And Bloomberg and, and Morgan in 1961, they formulated a theory of electron spin relaxation for aqueous transition metal ions. And this theory, if you read this paper, it's very clearly stated that this theory is valid only under certain conditions. That we have a highly symmetric system which uh, has no, uh, which has high symmetry and which has no 
uh, no interaction other than electron Zeeman and hyperfine uh, interaction when we when we look on the longer time scale. So there is a third interaction which sits here. You cannot see it, unfortunately. It's the zero field splitting, which is uh, a, a, an interaction which is related to spin orbit coupling and which is important in 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 the interaction involving the the electron spin. Uh, the assumption here in the Bloomberg and Morgan theory is that we have an oscillating transient zero field splitting with a, with a certain magnitude and undergoing rapid motions. Under these conditions, uh, no static zero field splitting, we get this simple uh, in simple expressions for the electron spin relaxation rates uh, R1 and R2, 1 over T1e and 1 over T2e. So uh, we can summarize the, the, these early days. Uh, we can obtain a complete theory by combining the work of Solomon, Bloomberg, and Morgan. We obtain the theory which is known in the literature as the SBM theory, Solomon, Bloomberg, and Morgan. And this gives us, uh, this theory can be summarized in terms of what is called modified Solomon, Bloomberg, and equations. So MSB and SBM is not quite the same thing, but almost. And uh, we, uh, we, can formulate this uh, this uh, the spin lattice relaxation rate and spin spin relaxation rate uh, in 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 a paramagnetic complex conforming to the to the to the uh, Bloomberg and Morgan theory, uh, and we have the the scalar and the uh, dipolar components, and we have uh, a bunch of correlation times which. Uh, depend on the rotational correlation time, on electron relaxation time, and on the exchange lifetime. So we have a, so to say, complete theory, which was developed in, in, in the mid 60s, early 70s. Uh, Koenig and Fiat are an important, uh, important authors and Ruben and, and co-workers. So we have this nice, theory simple is it to implement is it to understand now what's the, why why can't we why can't we use it in 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 more than than special situations well there is a number of problems one problem is that the solomon bloomberg and morgan theory is valid in the limit of high magnetic field so the zeeman interaction is the dominant interaction for, for the spins that we consider, the, the electron spin and the nuclear spin. Now, I don't need to, in this, to, to, to say to this audience that we sometimes don't want to be at the high magnetic field. We want to be at low magnetic field. We want to do field cycling. And then we, we are in, in trouble, potentially at least. Then we have another problem, and this is, uh, uh, known as decomposition approximation, uh, which says that we, we, we had this various correlation times. One was rotational correlation time, another correlation time was the electron spin relaxation time. Now, in order for this approach to be valid, the, these two processes, rotation and electron spin relaxation, have to be uncorrelated which uh, is problematic if you have systems of, of less than octahedral symmetry. For octahedral symmetry, it's fine. But many systems, such as contrast agents, for example, they don't uh, follow the decomposition approximation. And then the third problem is the validity of the perturbation regime. We call it perturbation regime. We, uh, we call it also Redfield limit, often after the work of, of uh, Al Redfield on, on this problem. Uh, so the assumption there is that the uh, product of the interaction strength, whatever it is, 
and correlation time squared, this product has to be has to be much less than unity. And this is usually fine when we talk about, about nuclear spin relaxation. But electron spin relaxation is more problematic because the, the electron spin interactions are so strong. So uh, we have a problem there and we need a theory which will take care of all these problems. Now, parts of this are, are quite straightforward, not, not too difficult to do. So uh, there is a, a class of theories for, electro, uh, for relaxation in paramagnetic systems, which are known as low field theories. Now, the idea comes from, from Lindner, but was not uh, very, very much used. She broke, formulated it already in mid 60s, but in the mid 80s, the group in Florence with Ivano Bertini uh, took up this model and, and, and presented a nice, uh, nice extension of it, which turns out, turned out to be, to be very useful. So what happens is you assume that the non, non Z, this is the Z-man interaction, this is the hyperfine interaction, then we have zero field splitting hidden there behind the pictures. Uh, and the, if, you has, if you say that the Z-man interaction is not very strong because the magnetic field is low, then maybe the zero field splitting interaction can be the dominant term in the Hamiltonian. We, if we in addition assume that the rotation is so slow that it's inefficient as a, as a modulation of the interactions, but it's sufficiently fast that we can, so to say, average, make a, that it makes the averaging for us uh, of over orientations, then we can use this theory. In addition, we have the problem with electron relaxation and originally the Florence approach was that one should treat a very simple uh, approach to, to electron relaxation. Then later on uh, we, we uh, Danuta, Thomas Nilsson and myself and, and the people in Florence uh, improved this theory so that the electron relaxation is described correctly within, within Redfield limit and this is known in the literature as modified uh, Florence model. So if we compare this modified Florence model and the, as the Solomon Bloomberg and Morgan, maybe I should not use the full screen, but you will see, uh, perhaps it's not, Good. Now it's, let, let me keep it this way. So what happens is uh, the, the modified Florence model can be compared with Solomon Bloomberg and Morgan theory. And with it, the, at, at high field, they are similar, but at low field, there are very, very significant uh, differences. Here, the, the, relax, the, the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement is plotted for spin one systems such as nickel ion, uh, versus as the function of the angle between the principal axis of the zero field splitting tensor and the dipole dipole interaction. And we can see that there is, there is a very large difference between these two models. Let's see. Uh, I, I should do it like this. So, uh, now, uh, we have mentioned the problem of electron relaxation. We have mentioned the problem of, of uh, uh, low field, but we still have this, this problem with the perturbation limit. And uh, we have been working with this in, in, in early 80s in Stockholm when, when Håkan Wennerström was, was, uh, was the head of the Division of Physical Chemistry. And we have developed what is now known in the literature as slow motion theory, or sometimes it's called Swedish slow motion theory. 
So what we have done is uh, uh, we have a problem with the Redfield condition, so uh, that it doesn't apply. So what we, what we can what we did was to replace the the Redfield equation for 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 the uh, motion of uh, in, in, of this of the nuclear spins by stochastic Liouville equation. Now in this way we were able to, to introduce a composite lattice with which the nuclear spin interacts. And the composite lattice was able to, to, to contain the quantum mechanical interactions such as electron Zeeman or zero field splitting and classical dynamic processes such as rotation or distortion. Now, making use of this, we were able to to go beyond the per perturbation regime because the rotation uh, was now treated as a, as a, as a so to say, degree of freedom of the system uh, along with the quantum mechanical uh, interaction. So the fact that the rotation was not fast enough to average out the, the zero field splitting was no longer a problem. And nuclear spins are coupled to the composite lattice by the hyperfine interaction in exactly in the same way as, as in, 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 uh, in the uh, Solomon Bloomberg theory. Now, using this approach, uh, we were able to, 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 to obtain an expression for the, let's see, let me just change one. We were able to I have to switch this off because something happened to my screen. Let me uh, go out. And start again. Okay, so uh, we can express the, the spin lattice relaxation uh, rate for, for a nuclear spin in a paramagnetic complex uh, as a uh, uh, real part of a complex spectral density corresponding to this, uh, describing the dynamics in, the, in this complex lattice. This expression looks very, very nice and simple, but the problem is that, the, that in order to obtain this spectral density, uh, it, it's, uh, we, we, need to do, uh, we need to do quite complicated mathematics. We need to set up and inverse a very large matrix uh, in the Liouville space, which contains the Liouville superoperator for the system uh, and, and uh, Larmor frequency. So uh, I skip the details of it. It's not so important in this, for this overview. Now, this approach was developed by, by uh, the Swedish groups, uh, Kowalewski, Wennerström, Westlund, and, and other people in the 80s and 90s. Now, uh, so this is one way to, to to, to, to resolve the problem with the with the uh, uh, with 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 the, with, the, with the, uh, the Redfield approximation. Now there is another way, and this is sometimes called in the literature the spin dynamics approach. Uh, we did uh, some work on it. Uh, Michael Odelius, uh, uh, my student at that time, uh, uh, and me did some work where we used quantum chemistry to calculate zero field splitting along a, 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 a molecular dynamics trajectory. From this, we could get the time variation of the zero field splitting. From the time variation of the zero field splitting, we could get the time correlation function for zero field splitting. And from that, we could get the variation of the spin Hamiltonian and the electron and nuclear spin relaxation. And here are some, some diagrams from, from, that, from, from these papers. Uh, we have the time correlation function for the zero field splitting. 
let me remind you in the simple approach with we assume that this would be a, an exponential decay now we can see that the, 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 the reality is more complicated and we could also get the, uh, the, the, the field dependence of the electron spin lattice relaxation time. So all this is available from this model where we actually do go from first principles. You, you calculate using one method, we used molecular dynamics, the time evolution of the system, uh, of the coordinates of the system, and then we use the, the quantum chemistry to calculate the zero field splitting and its variation. Now, this approach uh, is, is very complicated and it's not really easy to compare with anything else. But there is a possibility to make the, the spin dynamics much simpler. And this was developed by people such as Sharp, uh, Rust, uh, Fries, around the year 2000. So what they did was they said, well, let's assume that the static zero field splitting, the time average zero field splitting, the one which is modulated by rotation, uh, it has a certain magnitude. And then we have the transient zero field splitting, the, the one which is oscillating, which is modulated by distortions of the, of the, of the uh, complex. And making this assumption, we can do the same thing as I showed you in the last slide. We can calculate the time variation of the spin Hamiltonian. We can calculate the electron spin relaxation. And we can calculate the effect of electron spin relaxation on nuclear spin relaxation. And all the calculations are done in time domain. All the calculations in the slow motion approach are done in the frequency domain. So the mathematics is completely different but lo and behold, the results are the same. In 2008, uh, we published a paper uh, authored by Beloriski, Fries, and some other people. Uh, Danuta was one of them. And uh, what we did was we compared the calculated PRE in this model uh, against the magnetic field, so the nuclear magnetic relaxation dispersion diagram. Uh, we did that using different theories and 50 different parameter sets. And it turned out that the Stockholm model, which are here pre is presented here by squares, and the, <coughs> the model of Fries Beloriski, the Grenoble model, circles, uh, they are exactly on the top of each other. If we would see the, the points very much to the, to the right, there is a slight difference. The third model, was, which was also included in this comparison by Bob Sharp, triangles, is a little bit different. Not much, but it's, it's different. And we understand that this comes from slightly different treatment of electron relaxation than in the model used by ourselves and by the, the, the French model from, from Grenoble. Now, there are some complications and, uh, to this approach. We, uh, or there are some more complications which, which are not taken care of by, by the slow motion theory. And one such problem is a Curie spin relaxation. Now, the electron, uh, the interactions of the electron spin are so strong that the populations of different levels different Zeeman levels are sufficiently different from each other to, to make a difference, uh, to, to cause, to cause uh, complications. And uh, this was dealt with by Garon, Vega and Fiat in the mid 70s. They presented uh, what is called uh, the Curie spin relaxation model, which is particularly important for T2 in large molecules, uh, but it is something that needs to be considered. Now, I, I'm glad to, to see that Malcolm is here because here I want to make a reference of his, to his work from earlier this year. Uh, I think the, the theory they presented, uh, which is valid beyond the, the high temperature regime, 
uh, this could be in a useful way applied to curious spin relaxation. It would give a consistent description of Solomon type theory and curious spin uh, theory. Now, another complication is uh, that all I have was speaking about so far is for inter intramolecular relaxation, where the electron spin and nuclear spin are in the same molecule. But it does need to be the case. We need also a theory for intermolecular relaxation. And the, the slow motion theory uh, can actually be formulated for intermolecular relaxation also. Uh, and the problem is that these calculations are very time consuming. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, however, the situation is not all that black because if you look at, at low field, the, if you measure spin lattice relaxation uh, at, at low field, uh, it turns out that this is proportional to the square root of the, of the Larmor frequency in a, in a uh, model independent way. And from this proportionality constant, which we can easily determine experimentally, we can derive the diffusion coefficient uh, in, 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 in a nice way. This was discussed, uh, not, not least by, by Donald Takrook in, in, in the last decade. Uh, now, let me quickly move on to, 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 to the experimental situation. Uh, now, what can this be good for? Well, inorganic chemists uh, were interested in this type of approach uh, in order to characterize the, 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 metal, the, the metal complexes. Here is an example of a titanium salt and the measurements uh, were uh, concerned with oxygen 17 and with spin, spin relaxation in, in, in the systems. And measurements went down at three different magnetic fields as a function of, of temperature. And uh, the, the data could be presented in this kind of diagram. And this temperature dependence and the field dependence could be interpreted in terms of properties of, of the, of the uh, this complexes and allowed to, to obtain the, uh, the the mechanism of chemical exchange of water molecules between the complex and the bond. Sometimes also the, the, the pressure can be used as a variable and this allows also to, to get further detail of this, of this mechanistic, mechanistic uh, information. Now, uh, if you want to do the physics of relaxation, if you want to understand the physics of relaxation, the experiment par excellence is, is, does not use the temperature as a variable, but uses the magnetic field. And in this audience, I don't need to, to tell you about the, the fast field cycling methodology developed in the late 50s by, by, uh, by Redfield and Koenig and Noack and, and other people. Uh, what I'm interested in, th these measurements have many, many applications, for example, to characterize why, uh, as we saw last week. Uh, what I'm interested in is that this type of measurements provide critical text, tests of relaxation theories. And an important application that I'm interested in is for the characterization of the MRI contrast agents. Uh, I will not speak more about proteins, so I think I skip this slide and, and move on to the, to the MRI contrast agent because the time is running quickly. Uh, so <clears throat> now if we want to, to make a good contrast agent, we need to know in which way it behaves as a function of magnetic field because we want to do our, uh, our uh, magnetic resonance imaging at a certain magnetic field. So we want 
to have a, a contrast agent which will be, have good efficiency, which means high relaxation rate per millimolar concentration of contrast agents at the field of the MRI scanner. Here are some data uh, obtained for a, for a contrast agent uh, by the experimental data from Van der Elst uh, and her, uh, her laboratory. And the fitted curve is from the work by, by Donald and myself, uh, which can be found in the, the review <coughs> by ourselves in, in the uh, e-magress. The fitting here was done using the, the slow motion approach. Now, uh, some, this was for a gadolinium complex. Gadolinium uh, has very highly symmetric electronic structure with seven unpaired electron spins sitting in seven F orbitals. And this means as a, as a consequence that the electron spin relaxation in, in gadolinium is, is, is rather slow. Uh, nickel, has a, a highly asymmetric electronic structure. And this has a consequence that the electron spin relaxation in, in nickel complexes is very fast. And this means that if we look at an, a, a, an, an MRD profile at low field, the, well, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, standard uh, uh, relaxometers go about to, to this field, about one Tesla. Uh, so there is not much action going on there. Uh, so for the, we were interested in the systems in nickel in, 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 in water or in water glycerol mixtures uh, for a long time. And some years ago, we, we decided to, 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 happen, to see what happens if you go to as high magnetic fields as you can possibly reach. So we went to the high field lab in Grenoble and did measurements up to 32 Tesla. And you may like to know that 1000 megahertz corresponds to 23 Tesla. So this is much above what is currently available in high resolution. In measuring spin lattice relaxation, you don't need high resolution. So this is, uh, this is a nice feature of this type of measurements. Uh, well, here we have the experimental data uh, with, in red. And what we can see here is that the, 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 field, the relaxation rate goes up with the magnetic field up to about 25 tesla or so, and then it turns turns down, it starts going down. <clears throat> and we, we did similar experiments number of years ago, but at that time we went to the highest field available in this period. So we didn't get this, this curve turning down. <clears throat> the fitting here, the, the fitted points are the black ones. And this is done using slow motion theory for inner sphere we made a very big effort to include the inner sphere plus outer sphere, but it turned out that, that we, we, we were not able to get the results which we would, uh, we would believe to be reasonable. We had problem with fitting basically. Now, so what could be done uh, if you have this kind of, of, of problems with the model which contains too many parameters compared to the features that you have in your experiment. Well, one way is to, to, to introduce another experiment. And as I told you uh, in the paramagnetic systems, ESR, electron spin resonance, is one such possible model. Um, and by doing ESR on, on, your, on your sample, uh, you can actually obtain additional information. And this idea was, as far as I know, first, first uh, introduced and attempted by the group in, in, in Lausanne, Powell, Merbach, and other people in, in mid 90s. And they, their interpretation was, was essentially using the, the SPM theory. But the idea was very good to do the, the experiments. Uh, now what happens is that if you do an MRD 
you cover the frequency range from kilohertz to megahertz, few megahertz. Now, if you go, if you include the ESR, you can go up to hundreds of gigahertz. And you can, so if you devise a theoretical model, which works for both an MRD and ESR, it is reasonable to expect that, that it captures the essential physics. And we have applied these ideas at the level of slow motion theory. Uh, the, now, how do we combine the NMRD and DSR? Well, I mentioned to you this big matrix which we need to invert in order to get the, the spin lattice relaxation rate for, for nuclear spins. Actually, the same matrix has to be constructed and inverted to predict the SR line shapes. The difference is that you do it at different frequencies, and the other difference is that you look at different matrix elements of the inverted matrix. And MRD is interested in these elements here, ESR is interested in, in, in other elements. So uh, if we have a certain set of parameters and, and we can use this, the same matrix to calculate the ESR light shape and NMRD, and this may be something useful. So we did this for, for a, uh, a, a, a contrast agent known as P760, gadolinium compound, and we, we used the, the, uh, the NMRD in a, more or less the same way as I showed you before for another gadolinium complex, and then we use the parameters coming from the NMRD to simulate ESR at high fields. The first approach was not very successful. The black curve here is experimental, and the red solid line is, is what we obtained from these calculations. So the, the agreement is not impressive. But then we also have here the dashed curve, red curve, which is much better. And now this has been obtained uh, throwing in a, a, a small amount of G tensor anisotropy as an additional relaxation mechanism for electron spins. ESR people that I talk to say that this, this delta G is, is sort of reasonable for, for gadolinium complexes. Uh, so this indeed can be, uh, can be, uh, can perhaps turn out to be, to be uh, a good interpretation of this data. Now, there is a lot of interesting things in this EPR. We can see that uh, at, at very high fields, 237 gigahertz, this is 9.4 Tesla for electrons, uh, we get the, the, the line broadening uh, caused by, by, the, by the G anisotropy. Uh, if we look at the lower field, we get actually the, the light narrowing uh, caused by, by the G anisotropy. So it, there is a lot of nice features in it. Uh, now, the last thing I wanted to, to mention is uh, this combined ESR and intermolecular PRE work on nitroxides in glycerol. And the experimental work is, 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 uh, comes from Danuta's lab. Uh, and and we, she has done most of the theoretical work also. So here, when we work with nitroxides, the, the electron spin situation is, uh, electron spin relaxation is, is, is simpler, it can be described within red field theory. So we just need to think about including the right interactions in the right place. So here we have a system where we measure on protons, we have electron spins, and this electron spins interacts with nitrogen spins in the nitroxides. Now we can have nitroxides with nitrogen 14 or nitrogen 15, which creates uh, different uh, situations. Uh, unfortunately, the, the time is running fast, and I will not be able to tell you very much more about this interesting work, but you can look, it's published by, by Danuta in, in the last decade. Um, let me skip this. And here are some nice profiles. 
uh, on this uh, nitroxides. Let me come to the conclusions. So the theory of paramagnetic relaxation is quite complicated because of the strength of interactions involving electron spin. Simple theoretical pictures of, this, uh, of, of these systems is, is possible in limiting cases. If you want to have a more general description, description you need to use more complex theories. Now, uh, the variable field spin lattice relaxation is highly informative. And I believe that the combination of ESR and MRD will be, is likely to be used more in the future work. I didn't tell very much about paramagnetic proteins, but it, you will take my word for it that it remains a hot field. And with this, I would like to finish. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, long-term cooperation with Danuta, uh, which was sort of summarized in, a, in, in this Ima Gress paper a few years ago. Uh, I would like to acknowledge also uh, uh, long-term collaboration with a group in, in Florence, Ivano Bertini, Claudio Lucinat, Giacomo Parigi in the first place. And I would also like to thank the Swedish Research Council for long-term financial support. And I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, you can see this nice picture of, nice view of Overs Central Stockholm.